What's up guys, this is Frozen Electronics coming at you from Ottawa, Canada, up in the chilly north where it's, uh, you know, pretty much always snowing and freezing out. Today I'm just going to do um, the first uh, of hopefully many tutorials. Um, today's topic is the Bus Pirate. Um, this is a little board built by a very cool company called Dangerous Prototypes. You can check them out at DangerousPrototypes.com. Um, I've had a bus pirate for quite a while now, and it comes in handy quite often. Um, the name comes from the fact that you can hack into basically uh, almost any serial protocol. Um, I have my little um, cards up on the wall to remind me of what protocols it can do and what configurations they need to be. So, ignore the picture of my friend there. There is the standard cable that comes from Seed Studios with it, the colors that correspond to the different types. Now you notice it says MISO, CS, MOSI, and CLOCK, which is the SPI standard. However, this is how it's actually configured for the other ones. So it can do one wire, UART, uh, two wire, or I2C, SPI, or three wire. And also it can do JTAG, but using it for JTAG um, is a bit more complex, and we're not gonna get into that in this particular um, tutorial. At the far left you can see it says Hi Z, or Hi Z. Sorry, I was halfway between American and Canadian there. We say Z, and the Americans say Z. I think they're a little bit crazy for saying that. Anyway, uh, so its default state is Hi Z, which means high impedance. Um, so it'll automatically go into that state. Just in case you have things hooked up wrong, uh, you have no chance of frying anything or, um, you know, having things not work properly. So this is the Bus Pirate, um, it's USB, it comes with the USB cable and also uh, usually it comes with one of these default cables that just has a bunch of these little grabbers on the end um, and that correspond to each one. I've, unfortunately the colors don't match the clips, sometimes they do match and then there's a couple that don't, um, I guess because they only make the clips in so many colors. Um, so yeah, it's a 10 pin um, output header just like uh, in the AVR JTAG or the AVR 10 pin ISP. Um, not the same layout, but I mean just the same header. For those of you that are familiar with those, that's what it looks like. Over here, those holes there, that's the programming header for the PIC. And right there is the main microprocessor, which is a PIC 24. I can't remember the exact model number off the top of my head. Then above that, um, that's basically just a shift uh, no, sorry, that's an FTDI chip, sorry, um, which is the USB to serial converter so that the chip can communicate directly. Um, this is the version 3.6, I think it is. If I remember correctly, the new version 4 uses a different pick that actually has the USB integrated, so there's only one chip instead of two. This chip down here is just a shift register. I think that's just a 74HCT244, if I remember correctly. Um, and then you can see that the inputs and outputs are labeled quite clearly on the silk screening and on the back they also have them laid out again uh, along with all the information about um, the uh, board. As you can see it's public domain, open source hardware logo, great to see. Uh, the interesting thing that it actually is public domain, they basically just give it away. They want no copyrights on it whatsoever. Um, of course you can buy it through them which helps support them making more cool hardware. So this is the board we're going to be interfacing to for this tutorial. Um, it's a real-time clock module that came with my FPGA dev board, which you'll see in another video soon. Um, so you can power it either through um, VCC. Um, in this case, it can take, I believe it takes, um, I think it's a range. It can accept either 3.3 or 5 volts to power it, uh, which we're connecting down at this header. Um, and then also there's a connection for serial data and serial clock, SDA and SCL, which is the I2C standard names. Um, there's also uh, the main chip there, which is the real-time clock chip. There's the 32 kilohertz watch crystal, as they call it. Uh, and then there's a selector, um, a jumper for either VCC or battery, depending on where you want the power to come from. And then they also break out two of the pins, clock output and interrupt, which are slightly more advanced features of this chip, which we're not going to be dealing with in this. Just so for this particular layout, um, if we go take a quick look again at our reference, you can see that I2C uh, for the data line goes to MOSI and the clock line goes to clock, so that's the uh, gray and purple lines. 
So, on the clips, you just simply look for the gray and purple lines, which we have right there. Uh, the actual clips are yellow and green. I also have the 3.3 volt hooked up, uh, the ground hooked up. And then there's also a line, it's the green one there, it says VPU, which is the pull-up resistor voltage. Now, I2C uses pull-up resistors. Um, the way I2C works is the line is pulled high to usually five volts or whatever operating voltage you're working at. And then the communicating devices pull the line down to ground in order to send a pulse. Um, in this case, I just have the pull-up resistor voltage connected to the same VCC line, which is just giving it the 3.3 volts. Um, so if you hook these up the way I've hooked them up, um, it should work great. So ground, voltage, and the voltage pull-ups. Um, MISO, which is the, or sorry, MOSI, which is the gray, goes to SDA. And then uh, clock, which is the purple one, goes to SCL. Sorry for the focus there. I'm going to have to learn a little bit more about this camera. But the autofocus seems to work pretty good. It actually has built-in macro, which is nice. I can get in nice and close now. Actually, that's not entirely true. We're not going to switch over to screen capture right away. I'm just going to set this down over there. So here's the bus pirate all hooked up. Now, obviously, you're going to want to plug in your USB. Look at it. There we go. So it powers up. The LEDs will change depending on what's going on, but right now only the power one is on. When you turn on, because this can actually supply the 5 volt and the 3.3 volt, which makes it really uh, handy for modules like this, that way you don't have to have your power supply going. You can just plug this in. That V-reg light will come on. Uh, also, if you turn the pull-up resistors on, I believe that light also comes on. Um, and then, of course, USB shows whether or not it's connected, and then the mode light comes on once you've taken it out of the high impedance mode and actually assigned um, information to it. All right, so um, this is going to be a step-by-step -step walkthrough of how to use a bus pirate. Um, I've showed um, us hooking it up to the... Um, real-time clock module that we're going to be using and I'm now uh, doing a screen capture of uh, one of my two screens but this is the screen we'll be using now because it uses an FTDI chip um, which is a USB to serial converter um, we're going to be using it as if it was a serial console so you need to get a serial terminal now I find the best one is one called real term um, there's another one called termite that's actually it's quite a simple user interface actually it's very simple um, but it doesn't give you the same power, and I kind of like some of the options in real term. Uh, it'll actually interpret some of the data for you. So I'll show you what I mean. So, for example, you can choose what you want it to display as, and there's a lot of options. Now, for the bus pirate, we're going to be choosing ANSI, which means it actually decodes the ASCII values that it gets back and uh, formats it to look a little nicer. Now, this is kind of small. I usually put the rows to about 40. I find that makes a big difference. So we go to port. Um, now all these settings, parity, data bits, stop bits, hardware, flow control, those are already set correctly. All we need to do is find the bus pirate, which will usually show up as something like this. Um, and this is Windows 7. Um, it'll be, it's VCP0. Mine just happens to be port 7. It could be something else. So you select that. Then you select the baud rate, which by default will be 115200. Then over here you click on change. Now that opens the port and sets all the settings you've been up to. Now you click up here in the box, type in the question mark. If you see the question mark come back like that with the yellow, that means you've successfully communicated with the bus pirate. So then we hit enter and it gives us all our options. Now this is actually, um, I know that a lot of people would love to have a graphical user interface, but this is actually not a bad way of doing it. Uh, if you're used to the command line in Linux at all, or uh, even if you use DOS or anything, you'll be right at home. This is actually, and even for those that have never used a command line ever before in your life, I mean, this is a very good introduction to it because it's actually very simple. Now in this case, what we're going to do is I'm actually going to quickly pull up the um, data sheet for the unit that we're using as we go. Anyway, so here's the uh, real-time clock uh, module, or actually this is just the chip, the PCF8563 by NXP. Now the important things that we're going to need to know are going to be 
here in the register organization. Now, the important thing is, um, if we were going to set the time, we would need to know these registers here. So, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. That H after it just means that it's a hexadecimal value. That's why when you get up here, it doesn't go to 10, it goes to 0A, 0B, 0C, etc. Most of what we'll be entering will be in hex, although it's just as easy to do it in binary. So, what we're going to do... Um, I sort of have this information written down, but if you need to, you can refer back to it. The other thing we're going to take a quick look at is the characteristics of the I2C bus. I believe this is the spot we need. Okay, yes, here we go. So, now the important thing we need to take or look at here is these two addresses. The way the I2C bus works, and this is actually great that this is in here, is that there's a stop, or sorry, a stop, a start condition. Now in this case, it's followed by the slave address, which is seven bits, and then the last bit is either a zero or a one, depending on if you're reading or writing. So if you, in our case, um, if we want to write the time to this real-time clock module so that it can uh, start keeping track of the time we would do the start condition the slave address plus write which in this case is a zero so up here we would be putting in this in binary or in hex it's just a2 followed by the acknowledgement from the slave which we don't actually trigger that we'll just see it come in then the register address that we want to write to now because it automatically increments after we type in the data, all we have to do is pick the one that we want to start with, which in our case, if we go back to our registers, we're going to start with the seconds at 0, 2. So, we're going to choose 0, 2 as the register address, then we get an acknowledge, and then we just start typing in data. Um, in this case, uh, there is... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 registers that we want to set. Now, in my case, um, I am going to quickly... Um, well, first of all, we have to set up SPI mode, so let's do that first. Now, once we're back here in the terminal, we want to change the mode, which is right there, which is a lowercase m. So we type in the lowercase m and hit enter. And it gives us all the options for all the buses it can do. Now, it can actually do a little bit more than what's listed here, but in order to do that, we need to change the firmware. And in this case, we don't need to because uh, I2C is right there. So, we're going to choose I2C, which is 4. In this case, we know that the speed is 400 kilohertz. And the way we figure that out, um, usually it's mentioned right at the top. Um, in this case, it says right there, 400 kilohertz, two-wire bus interface. Um, so we know that it's 400 kilohertz, so we'll select that, and that's it. For I2C, those are the only options. Some of the protocols on here, especially UART and SPI, um, have quite a few more options, and um, if you're ever using those, um, the important ones are usually the first one or two that they ask you. The rest you can usually just leave as default. But anyway, in this case, all we're doing is... Uh, I2C, so it's as easy as that. Now that we're in I2C mode, I'm actually going to reshow the help again. We need to, as it said before, we need to issue a start. Now, in I2C, um, you, we use a, a left square bracket and a right square bracket to do the start and stop. They also have the uh, option of doing a curly bracket, which will do a start followed by a read of one byte, and then uh, the other curly bracket is also just a plain stop. Now here's all the different ways you can send strings. If you send it with quotes, it'll actually send uh, the text encoded as hex, or you can just send decimal, hexadecimal, or binary. Now you'll notice that the format is different than in the data sheet. In the data sheet they showed 23H, or in this case 123H, but here we do 0X, um, which is usually how you'll find it notated in most data sheets and in microcontroller programming. Like if you're programming in C, you'll usually see it like this, 
and like this 0B110 instead of 110B, which is, might be how you see it in some other places. Um, the other commands that are important are R for read, and then this one down here, repeat. Now, and that's a good example, because um, sometimes you need to read more than one byte or write more than one byte that's the same, and that'll automate it for you. You can just do R colon 10, it'll read 10 bytes off the line, and then away you go. Also, in our case, um, remember that I showed that we hooked up the power supply and also the pull-up resistors. So in this case, we're going to turn the power supply on which is a capital W as you can see that correlates to on and then the lowercase w is off so we're going to turn the power supply on uh, the light has come on on our bus pirate uh, way to drop everything on the floor okay sorry about that and then we also need to turn the pull up resistors on so that will not only will it power the VCC line but now it will also turn the pull ups on to SDA and SCL um, we don't necessarily need to do this. Um, most uh, modules like this will have pull-up resistors built in, but it can't hurt. And so usually I will turn them on just in case the pull-up resist resistors aren't very strong. So we'll turn the pull-up resistors on. So now it's all set up and ready to go. And in the BusPyre interface, when you want to do a command, you just type it all in as one big long string and then hit enter. So in this case, we know we want to start with a start, which is that symbol, followed by the write address, because we're going to set the time. So we'll go back down. So the write address is A2 in hex. Now the way we type that in here is 0xA2. That needs to be followed by, uh, we'll get an acknowledge, but we don't have to worry about that. That'll come back automatically. The bus pirate takes care of that. It won't send the next byte unless it gets this acknowledge because it knows this protocol. Then we need to type the register address that we want, which is 0 by 0, 02. We'll get another acknowledge. Then we set the data. Now, in this case, um, we're going to just pretend that uh, we'll just set it for 9 o'clock in the morning. So the seconds in that case um, will be 0 by 0, 0. Now sometimes you have to look at the registers because sometimes their organization isn't perfect. For example, there's this VL bit here, but I actually can ignore that um, in this case. I think it will automatically set it for me afterwards. Um, so the next thing we need is the minutes, which we'll also set to 0 by 0, 0, just to make it nice and easy. Hours. 0 by 0, 09, which is the same in hex as it is in decimal. Um, days, uh, it's the fifth. Again, a nice easy one. Weekday, uh, today is Thursday, so that's uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so that's 0 by 0, 5 again. Oh, wait, no, no, because it starts at 0, so 0 by 0, 4. Um, yeah, you have to check that, because if it starts at zero, then you remember you have to subtract one. Um, anyway, because you remember you have to start, you're starting from zero. Uh, so, for example, midnight would be zero, but of course, in this case, nine o'clock is still nine o'clock. Anyway, century and months, the century bit we can ignore. The month we'll put in, um, it is currently December, which is, in hex, 13. It goes nine, then A, B, C, and then D for 13. 10, 11, 12, 13. Then the years, it happens to be the same thing. It's 2013. This, of course, has the Y2K bug. It only has two digits for the years, as you can see, 0 to 99. Um, but it does have the century bit, which would flip if we did get to a century, but we don't have to worry about that. And that's it. So we've entered in everything we need. Then we follow that with a stop bit. And we hit enter. And as you can see, it did the start bit, and then it wrote every value, and it got an acknowledge, which is the chip saying that, yes, I acknowledge that the data you got is good, and I have done whatever I need to do with it. Please send the next command until you send a stop bit, and then it's done. So now what we're going to do is we're going to, right now the clock is ticking away. So now we're going to read what we just did back. So again, we'll go to the protocol and we'll look at the read. 
Uh, this is slightly more complex because we do need to, first you need to write the address that we want to read from and then switch over to read mode. So we start out the same way. We do a start followed by the write address, which is A2, followed by the register we want to start at, which is again 02. Then we do what's called a repeated start. We send the start again. We could send a stop and then another start, but if we had more than one device on this bus, you could possibly lose arbitration, which means that another master could start sending data uh, potentially to this same slave and that would screw up our whole process here because it needs to remember what register we were trying to um, what register we wrote to and that we want to now read from so by doing a repeated start it ensures that we don't lose bus arbitration it refreshes the slave so that we can enter in a new slave address without losing um, arbitration of the bus. Now that's a little bit more of an advanced concept in I2C, which I'm not really covering, but I just wanted to explain that that's why we have another start there. So we do another start. Now we type in the slave address for reading, which is 0 by A3. And then it gives us an acknowledge and we start reading data. Now as I said before, there's seven registers that we want to read from. So we're going to do read seven. Remember how I showed you that the colon does repeat, so it's going to repeat seven times. And then we do a stop. So now I'm going to hit enter. What we seem to have figured out is that you can't change the columns at all. It'll just crash out every time. So unfortunately, um, we're just going to have to um, go with what we have. So it'll make it a little bit harder to read what we're getting back, but it's not a big deal. So let's just make sure the bus pirate's still doing okay. Alright, so we'll, uh, I think it remembers what we did. Yes, there. So there's the command we had before. We'll hit enter. Now you can see that it does the start bit. It writes the write address followed by the register, does the repeated start, then it writes the read address, and then just starts sending acknowledges and every time it sends an acknowledge which is part of our read process it'll send back a byte so as you can see 2704 that's the seconds minutes hours so four minutes and 27 seconds had passed since we set the time it's still the fifth um or maybe i have this a little messed up five two d o d knack Okay, there we go. So I guess there might have been some corruption there uh, when real term crashed out. Maybe it sent some weird data. But now we're getting the nice um, data like we sent. As you can see, I just reset it. And we can see the, as I hit enter here, we can see the seconds um, counting up right there. And then eventually it'll change the minute, then the hour, and then eventually the day. Um, both the day and the weekday eventually it would do the month and then the year now the reason that that's 2d is again I believe because the century bit was sent over here um, yeah I'm not entirely sure but anyway as you can see it's now actually working properly which is good so congratulations, I hope you followed along. As you can see, we're at 1 minute 6 seconds. I hope you learned a little bit about I2C and a little bit about the bus pirate. And um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments or contact me. I'll be happy to help you out.